This is Think Inclusive. I'm Tim Viegas. I love books, hardbacks, paperbacks, ebooks, audiobooks. I just love reading, period. And my TB Red Pile is stacked very, very high right now. A series that has been on my TBR list for years has been the Out of My Mind series by Sharon Draper. And I was very much hesitant to read the series at first, but something changed my mind. More on that in my interview with the author of the series after a short break. Welcome back to Think Inclusive. Each week, we bring you conversations about inclusive education and what inclusion looks like in the real world. Sharon M. Draper is a distinguished educator and author recognized as National Teacher of the Year and a five-time winner of the Coretta Scott King Literary Award. Her novel, Out of My Mind, was a New York Times bestseller. Draper has received numerous accolades, including the Milken Educator Award and the Margaret A. Edwards Award for Lifetime Literary Achievement. She has been honored at the White House and spoke at the National Book Festival Gala. Her work, Copper Sun, is internationally acclaimed and was named one of the 100 best books of all time by Time Magazine. This episode of Think Inclusive, we are joined by Sharon Draper an exceptional voice in middle grade literature whose books have captivated readers across the globe. Draper takes us behind the scenes of her creative process during the conversation, sharing the inspirations and challenges that shape her memorable characters and their stories. We begin with a deep dive into Draper's most beloved character, Melody, from the Out of My Mind series. We're given a unique window into Melody's world, exploring self-acceptance, belonging, and disability representation. Sharon outlines her meticulous approach to research, emphasizing the importance of authenticity in crafting a character like Melody, who has a cerebral palsy, and navigates a myriad of personal and social challenges. We talk about Melody's experience in summer camp in the second book in the series, Out of My Heart, Melody's friendships, and her quest for inclusion. We wrap up the episode with an exciting teaser from the upcoming third book in the series, where Melody's adventures will take her out of the country. Do you believe that all children with and without disabilities deserve to reach their potential through inclusive education? If so, you'll love Brooks Publishing. The premier publisher of books and tools on early childhood special education communication and language, and more. Brooks Publishing has been partnering with top experts for over 30 years to bring you the best resources for your classroom, clinic, or home. To learn more, visit brookspublishing.com to browse their catalog, read their blog, and sign up for their newsletter. Brooks Publishing helping you make a difference in the lives of all children. And just for Think Inclusive listeners, visit bit.ly slash brooks dash zero three two four to put your name and to win a copy of the facilitator's guide to the paraprofessionals handbook for effective support in inclusive classrooms or the IEP checklist, your guide to creating meaningful and compliant IEPs. We will be taking names until the end of the month and maybe a little bit into April. And now, my interview with Sharon M. Draper. Mrs. Sharon Draper, welcome to the Think Inclusive podcast. Well, I am delighted to be here as I try to turn off my phone so that it doesn't ring because it always does when I'm in the middle of something important. Watch, it's going to. I know. In fact, I should probably do that right now too. Yeah. 
Let's see. Uh, Settings. Okay, put it on airplane mode. All right, I beat. Yeah, I've actually been in interviews where um, where my phone rings and my phone is connected to my recording device, so you can actually hear the ring in. <laughs> yeah, the recording. Yeah. Yes. Oh, you have a, a furry friend back there with yeah, this you. This is Cookie. Come on. She expects. She knows when I have interviews that she gets cookies. Oh, come here. okay. Come here. come here. Say hello. Hi, Cookie. Say hello. Oh, hey there. She's in uh, both books, and briefly in the third book. So. But Melody has a golden retriever, so. Yeah. Uh, and yes. I've had like four golden retrievers in my life. So, uh, so I, if she, there's a golden retriever in all my books someplace. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that, it's butterscotch. Is that right? Yeah. Butterscotch in, yeah. In out of my in mind. The, in the, but yes. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I, so I, I want to start off with, um, just a quick story about my daughter. Uh, she's 11 years old. She's in sixth grade. And uh, probably in fifth grade, she picked up out of my mind and was like, hey, daddy, you know, you used to be a teacher, used to be, uh, used to teach, um, you were a special education teacher. Have you ever read out of my mind? And I was like, no, actually, I haven't. I've heard about it. I know about it, but I have not read it. And so she's like, daddy, you got to read it. You got to read it. And then she got out of my heart and she read it and loved it and said, daddy, you need to read out of my mind and out of my heart. And so I was like, okay, okay, you're right. I, I need to read it. Uh, it. It's been on my list for years. I just haven't done it. And then one day we were on the couch, I think just relaxing. And I saw my daughter reading your books again, probably for the second or third time. And it dawned on me, um, this story has really captivated my daughter, um, and has really inspired her to know more about what I do, what I did as a teacher. And then also, uh, what we do as an organization, because MCIE works with school districts on, on how to, um, you know, be more inclusive for all learners. Um, and I was like, I need to reach out to, uh, Mrs. Draper and see if she would want to be on the conclusive our podcast and and here you are i'm delighted i'm glad to be <laughs> um and so i did tell my daughter hey i'm going to give you an opportunity to ask mrs draper a question so um i'm going to queue up the question we'll listen to it and then we'll have okay. you answer it does that sound okay. good all right yeah, i go. like any questions from the young people all right here we go why did you choose cerebral palsy as the disability for melody when you could have chosen from many others Okay, good question. Why did I choose cerebral palsy? Well, when you're an author, I wish you could see, I guess you can see behind me, my the stacks of books behind me, and then I've got another bookshelf full of books on this side. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a reader as a child, and um, I liked reading about young people with challenges, young people that were different, young people that had to do something different. Um, um, there was a book called Danny Dunn and the Homework Machine. It's an oldie but goodie. <laughs> but it's about this kid that invented a homework machine that could, you know, so nobody had to do homework because you just typed it into the homework machine. We now, kids now have homework machines on their tablets, you know, yeah, exactly. But Danny Dunn was was way before his time. So I was a reader, and uh, and I knew that I wanted to write about a child that was different, that was struggling, that was just as smart as anybody else. Because I taught for like nine million years, and hmm. it's always the 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 young person who learns differently. You know, I've had blind kids. I've had kids in wheelchairs. I've had um, kids with uh, various devices, you know, uh, because we were in a school district that had a general population, but everybody was welcome as long as they could 
figure out a way to get them up and down the stairs and, um, you know, on the elevators and so forth. So um, when you're a writer, you have to choose your problem, okay? You have to choose what the difficulty will be. Any movie that you watch, um, I don't know what the current movie is that all the kids are watching, but um, give me one that, that's popular that they're oh, watching. Oh, gosh. Um, Something let's that's... See. The uh, oh gosh, now you put me on the spot, Mrs. Draper. Uh, um, I don't know, Barbie. Uh, but ba- ba- Barbie's good. My my kids watch Barbie. That that's a, that's got a big problem, right? Yeah. Okay. So, what is Barbie's problem? How does Barbie solve the problem? Um, the how does Barbie, um, you know, get from point A to point B? How do you write a story about uh, a fashion model, you know, who has a perfect life? was a perfect boyfriend uh you know, mm, right, you know how yeah. do you make this fictional character seem real when you make it into a movie so there's an awful lot you have to think about so you choose your character your character has to have a problem because if you have a character that has no issues okay my name is Susie. i am perfect i make straight b's uh i've never been rained on Nothing bad has ever happened to me. My dog has never been hit by a car. I've never, uh, you know, been lost in the woods. I've never, you know, so you have to create a problem. Otherwise, nobody wants to read it. Your character has to have a problem. It has to be a believable problem and it has to be a solvable problem or at least a challenge that can be dealt with. So I chose that after lots and lots of research and gave Melody, um, uh, I've had students with lots of medical conditions. And so I gave Melody a medical condition and I just worked at it. I did tons and tons and tons and tons of research. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking mm-hmm. almost a year of research before I even began to uh, to study. I remember I used to visit schools all the time and I went and I um, talked to the school and there was a young lady there in a wheelchair. and. Um, and she she raised her hand and she had difficulty speaking. And she said, I think you ought to write a movie about a kid like me. I mean, write a book about a kid like me. And I said, that's a good idea. And then everybody else in the classroom. Yeah. How about me? And how about me? And how about me? So you have to find your person. You have to find your problem. You have to define the problem. You have to somehow come to a resolution or at least acceptance of the problem. And it has to have a satisfying end so that the reader, when they finish it, that was good. It's hard. It's long and it takes years to do. So it's kind of hard to answer in two minutes, but that's, that's a good question and a hard question. And if you want to be a writer, you have to do that. Another thing I tell students, if you want to be, let's say you want to be a painter, you have to decide if this painting is going to be red or blue, or blue with green speckles, or is it gonna have people in it, or is it gonna have dogs in it, or is it gonna be funny, is it gonna be sad? You, as the creator, get to decide that. So I have a zillion options, and those are the options that I chose for this book. Yeah, and Melody is is real, <laughs> you know? Like, she's she. I know she's a character, and I know that she's a, a complete fiction, but uh, when you read the books, uh, the problems are real. The problems are what a lot of people face, um, particularly those, um, with disabilities. Um, so let me, let me share this with you. So I, I was hesitant to read the books. Um, I was a special education teacher for 16 years. Um, so and you know the group. I know. Yes. So, and I taught in, in self-contained special education classrooms. I had students with various, uh, various, uh, you taught in age five. <laughs> you taught uh, in age five. I did. I did. And actually what's really funny is I taught in a, um, a school where we had a pod a, so it was very <laughs> similar. And that's something is <laughs> very similar. And, you know, I'm sure, um, a lot of our listeners are educators uh, and, and that are special education teachers. Um, and so 
this kind of uh, language is really is really interesting. And I was hesitant to read the book because I had gotten some feedback, uh, particularly from disabled people that I know, like disabled you know activists and and advocates um, that didn't appreciate the way that Melody had, I guess, the language she was using to describe herself and and kind of the negative self talk. But I, you know, I wanted to talk with you, and I read both books. Because I really see Melody's arc as coming to a self-acceptance and really finding herself and her voice. And, you know, characters aren't perfect, right? Characters, Mm -hmm. characters grow. And so there's aspects of Melody's, you know, character and arc that are going to resonate with people and some that may, may rub people the wrong way, but isn't that the, isn't that the point? Isn't that the point of having like a rich character? Right. And if I had made her not realistic, if I had made her um, un- not believable, then I would have gotten criticism from the other side. Said, oh, you just made this, this fairy tale person and it's not like that. Mm-hmm. And a, a person who has a disability would have trouble going to the bathroom, you know, would worry about you know, whether she was looking cute for a boy, those kinds of things. So I had to do real world things uh, in order to make it real. And I know I've I've read the criticisms too, but ultimately I think Melody emerges victorious. And she's one of the few severely handicapped protagonists that emerges victorious. So yay for Mm -hmm. Melody. (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah and um well at the end of the first book and i apologize if i'm spoiling it for yeah i mean everyone should read the books i i think and then it sounds like there's going to be a, a third one um but the you know the the end of the first book really sets up um the the acceptance that melody feels in her life, it's like, well, you know what? If no one else is going to be looking out for me, um, I have to look out for herself. Yes, for my, yes, yes, yes. And while, right, we want we want classrooms, we want schools, and we want our you know community to be accepting of everyone. We want to build environments where everyone can be you know thrive and to uh, to have belonging. Um, but the way that you set up this problem that Melody has, um, I think is, I think it brings energy to it, right? And it brings energy to the second book, uh, which, you know, again, no spoilers. Um, I think, you know, is, is, uh, she goes to it, summer camp. Yeah. We can talk about that. In the second book, she goes to summer camp and she meets a boy and she likes a boy and he likes her. So there, you know, let's <laughs> give her some points there so the second book is melody going to camp Mm -hmm. uh and it's a camp that is designed uh to support uh you know individuals with disabilities so there's um you know the 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 camp counselors actually um have disabilities um and the campers uh you know are, are people with disabilities uh is this based on a camp that you that you were aware of or you kind of put it Um, together from yes and no and both um i um uh i did a lot of research on camps for uh kids with disabilities and there's one probably in every state some states have a lot and you know some are better funded than others but i i visited a, a couple of them and they're really good. The people who work there are just awesome people. You know, they're just really cool people. And and uh, they love their jobs and they, you know, they don't consider it a burden. It's like, hey, why not? Why can't they go camping and go on a rowboat and go, you know, do those kinds of things? So uh, I expanded her world and sent her to camp in um, in the second book. And you want to know what she goes in the third one? I would love to. 
I don't know if I can tell you or not, but she. <laughs> no. I don't know either. It's this, this right. break, breaking news. <laughs> breaking news. Book three, she goes out of the country. Oh, okay. She goes on a plane ride and she goes out of the country. Um, she becomes a hero. She saves somebody's life. Yes, Melody saves somebody's life. And and the long and the short of it, she ends up going to London. And that wow. was due last week. So I've got to hurry up and finish it. <laughs> 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 well, right after right after you finish, you can just okay. you know get up, okay. get on that. Okay, yeah, I've got it pretty much together. <laughs> um, in so in in this camp, you know, is she uh, she meets a boy. Um, she has some really fun experiences and novel experiences, like riding a horse, going on a zip line. Um, but ultimately, it's really like about friendship, right? It's about friendship. It's about belonging. Um, and I'm just wondering, do you, so Melody experiences it th- this at the camp, um, but Melody can experience that anywhere, right? Not just at that camp. What do you mean? I mean, if there's somebody who's willing to, um, you know, work with her and cooperate with her and meet her on her level and, you know, deal with what she needs. Um, you know, like I tell kids all the time, if I'm talking to a group of kids at school, I say, raise your hand if you wear glasses. Raise your hand if you can't see without your glasses. So okay, take your glasses off. And you have to do the next week without your glasses. <laughs> see, you know, everybody has some sort of disability or some sort of thing that they have to adjust or adapt to. So they see it a lot more that way when they can see something that that they um you know that they could experience so i tried to make it realistic for kids and i wanted it to it to be a learning experience as well without mm-hmm. it being preachy because kids will run away from a book that's preachy We had like the the school that the school that um, I used to work for actually uh, my daughter goes to to the middle school and they have opportunities you know like in 4H or whatever or Pod A where I used to work you know kids are separated right kids are and- separated and so my daughter who is typically developing and in you know general education classrooms she doesn't have the opportunity to even hang out or spend any time with uh kids who are different um but they're starting to at this middle school uh expand the opportunities for her to be able to spend time and to actually be friends with Mm -hmm. uh people who are different so and she was just so excited like she definitely saw the connection between um, me reading the, or her reading the stories and then experiencing it in real life. You know, And it's important for young people to do that because we live in a real world. And if you go shopping or you go to the Walmart or Target and somebody comes at you with a wheelchair, you should know to say hi instead of run the other direction to say hi and wait for a response. Hope you have a good day. I love your blue shirt. That kind of thing. So even if kids just learn that much, that that to be friendly to somebody that might look or act or operate differently than they do. Right. And that's, you know, that's, um, I mean, it's not enough, right? It's not enough, but it's, it is a starting point. Start. It's a start. Yeah. 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 Um, you said that you're a former educator. So. Oh, I taught for 30 years. You taught for 30 years in public yeah. schools? In public school, yeah. Wow. Sixth grade through 12th. I've taught them all. Wow. I like sixth so, graders. They're, they don't know everything yet. And seniors <laughs> know absolutely everything. <laughs> Nothing you can teach me except give me my diploma. <laughs> yeah, I enjoy it. Um, oh, wow. So what got you into writing then? 
I was a writing teacher. And, oh. um, you know, I taught English writing, language, uh, composition. And we did a lot of writing in class. And I, you know, I dabbled at home a little bit. But what got me started was I had a student, and it was not my best student. It was one of my worst students who uh, found this application for a writing contest in a magazine and said, you think he's so bad, why don't you write something? And so seriously, that's what he said. And so he gave me the application, and I said, okay, why not? So I wrote a little story, and I... uh, I, I sent it in and it was months before they replied, but I got first prize. So that was wow. my first piece of writing. Wow. Okay. And so did you, the, um, what was your first book? Cause I don't think it was out of my mind, correct? No, it was Tears of a Tiger. Okay. And Tears so it's the first one. So Tears of a Tiger, uh, how far along were you in, in your teaching career? Uh, that you published your first book? Um, I guess near the end. Mm-hmm. I I was I was close to retirement and the story came out and I got my picture in the paper and it was a big deal. And I had been dabbling more and more with writing and I had enough years in to retire. So I did. And then I, I said, OK, I'm going to write full time. Had no idea what that meant. Wow. Uh, the first book that I wrote. I sent, and I, I just sent this email to a young lady. I, I get lots of letters from prospective writers mm-hmm. and I have no answers. Don't write me because I, I can't help <laughs> it. I really can't, I really can't. But what I told her was my first book I sent um, to 25 different publishers and I got 24 rejection letters in a row. And this is before we had email. These came in the mail, postage mails, big thick rejection letters. No, 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 no. 24 of those. And it took months for them all to come. And so I was depressed and down and and said, well, maybe I'm not such a writer after all. But the very last one was a yes. And it was Simon & Schuster. So the rest is history. Wow. Wow. And you just continued to to publish books. And now now you're publishing the third book in the, I guess, are, does it, are you calling it a particular series? Is it the out of? It's the out of my something. Out of my something. So the third it's, book will have out, that. Out of, out of my mind, out of my heart. And this one is out of my, I'm not telling, but it's out of my no, something. Yes. Out of my, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That, that, that might be too far. Your yeah. publisher might not like that. Yes. Yeah, so, but it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, Okay, we're in first edits, which is the hardest. And my editor is just like I was with my students. She goes over that thing with a fine tooth comb. Well, what about this? And what about this? And you left this out and you never resolve that problem. And what about this? And how could she possibly? And what do you think? (laughs) She's good, though. I love her and I hate her. She's very, very good. You need a good editor. You need a good editor. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) <laughs> um i mean i uh produce i produce this this interview podcast so i don't you know i edit myself i don't have an editor but um i did do a narrative series um where i was i'm telling the stories of inclusive schools and and uh, families uh moving towards full inclusion for their for their children and lots of different interviews lots of different narration and script writing on my part <clears throat> I wish I had somebody going over with a fine tooth comb because as you know, as a writer, editing yourself is so difficult. You can't do it because you can't see your mistakes. Whereas a a different person could look at it and say, well, she said blue 14 times in the last six pages. How about if we vary the colors? Oh, you know, it's not, it's the kind of thing I wouldn't have noticed, but an editor does. But then she does things like, okay, you've got this, but this doesn't make sense. And this doesn't follow through. And you mentioned this in chapter 12, but you never went back to it. So either continue it or delete it. Oh, she's hard. She's really hard. She's good. Yeah. That's great. Um, 
Okay, so I a couple questions popped up about Melody, and and so the couple different uh, interesting character characteristics about Melody is uh, synesthesia, right? That she uh, can um, see well, she can see colors based on is it music? Yes, she can see colors. She can feel music. Synesthesia is a it's it's a it's a, a wide variety of definitions, but it's people who can interpret the senses differently than other people. And yeah. you know, so if you can feel for uh if you ever see um I don't know, a puppy that's been hit by a car, your feelings, you know, mm-hmm. what are those feelings? You know, if you go in the um, I used to tell my students, focus on the on the five senses. You know, if you walk outside barefoot in the snow, what does it feel like? Have you been barefoot in the sand? What is the difference between barefoot in the snow and barefoot in the sand on a beach? You know, what what's the difference? You know, how many different colors of blue can you mention? What do armpits smell like after a basketball game? So you've got to include <laughs> all of the senses. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. And then the other aspect, which we haven't talked about yet, is that uh, Melody is non-speaking, but uses a communication device um, to and she types to communicate. Um, so it's interesting because you talk about the, the you talked about the beginning of our conversation, um, setting up the problems. Right. So we like with as as far as Melody goes, she has a lot of problems that she's got to solve, right? Not only like the ableism that is inherent in kind of our society, but also she has communication that she wants to get out that she had to figure out how to do, right? She's got a mind, and she's she's got so much to say. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So um, was that more of a um, like a literary convention, like trying to like come up with a problem that was so big um, to make, to make her character or it was it, was it like you trying to like, what was behind that particular? I get asked that question a lot. I don't use literary conventions for the sake of, okay, let's put some symbolism here on page 12. You know, it's, it's how the story developed. Uh, mm. You know, uh, I tell kids, you've got to make sure you use all the sensory input possible. And so since Melody's uh, had difficulties uh, with parts of her body, her other senses would be heightened. Mm. And a lot of people like blind people can often hear very good. And, you know, pe- people who who have certain disabilities have other things that are better than others. Mm-hmm. So um, I did a lot of research to, to make it realistic and to make sure that it was, um, uh, you know, true to a character like this. It took a long time. Yeah. You know, it yeah. was not written overnight. It was several years I worked right. on it. Well, and then so the so out of my mind came out in, in 2010. Is that right? Uh-huh. And then out of my heart came out just within the last two years. Ago. Two years. Uh, last year, I think it was two years. Yes. Okay, but the as far as the, that, it took ten years. Did you want to oh. sit, like what was it? Just, were you working on other on other things? And oh then yeah, just I've mo- written I've written like twenty other books. <laughs> so yeah, right, I've right, right. A lot of other books while I was waiting to to do the next one. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, I wrote blended. Oh yeah. Right. Yes. Which is about, uh, a girl who, uh, she's a biracial child and, um, she, and in addition to being biracial, she's, her parents are divorced. And so she lives with her mom, uh, one week, and her mom works as a waitress at uh, uh, Chuck E. Cheese or something like that. And her father, her mother is white. Her father is black. And he is uh, uh, wealthy. 
you know, a rich attorney, you know, so she's blended so many ways. She's blended racially. She's blended socially. She's blended culturally. And she's 12. So she doesn't know where, where she falls in the world. You know, where is my place? Where do I fit in? As most kids this age, as they're approaching adolescence, feel like they don't fit in anywhere. So blended shows how she manages to awkwardly sometimes blend her family and her life together. Mm-hmm. You have to mm-hmm. read that. One. Tell your daughter she's she can read that one. She's she's uh, she's old enough to read it. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think yeah. In fact, I think she told me about it um, that she wanted to she wanted to read that one. Uh, as for you, the all the books that you've written, do you is there like a common theme that no. no. Yeah, no. Uh, themes are something that teachers ask students to do. <laughs> what is the theme of this book? Uh, writers don't do that. <laughs> you write a story, you create a character, you create a problem, you try to solve the problem, and whatever conclusion the reader comes to at the end of it, that's the theme. I don't plan a theme. You know, <laughs> the students say, Did you plan? For the theme to be, we should all love each other. I said, yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> I don't plan a theme. I write the story. I write the characters. I create the problems. You figure out the theme. I don't do that. Interesting. So you're just basically creating worlds, right? Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there's a movie coming out. Yeah, there's a movie coming out. There's a movie coming out. Out of My Mind premiered at the, at Sundance. Yes. Um it was actually this year, January of 2024, right? Yes. Just yes. A while ago. Just so a while ago. what was that like to experience the story that you wrote being envisioned on the big screen? Well, first of all, you have to step back and let go mm. because it's no longer your baby. It belongs to somebody else who's dressing it up in different clothing. So... They did a wonderful job. You know, I've seen the movie. They've done a really good job. The the young lady who they chose to play the part of Melody actually has cerebral palsy. And she's a fine actress. And how they found her, I don't know. But she (laughs) really, really did a good job. All of the the cast did a really excellent, excellent job. Um, When I saw the whole thing in in the movie theater... I cried. I mean, it was genuine. It was that good. They did an Mm. excellent job. It will be released on the Disney Channel. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) It's finished, but I don't have anything to do with the negotiations between the company that made the movie and the Disney people. I, 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 I have nothing to do with that. I get emails that say, oh, by the way, it'll be out on Tuesday. So they have not given me a date, but I know that it's going to be on Disney. I know that it's going to be soon. I just don't know when. Okay. And it will be interesting to see what students think of the interpretation. Because every time I read a book and see the movie, I always like the book better. Mm -hmm. So because it's somebody else's interpretation of what these characters are. But I think they did a very fine job. I'm, re- I'm very pleased with it. Well, I mean, that, I mean, that's good since you wrote it and you have that opinion. I think that that's probably a good sign. A I didn't have sign. much choice, but, but they just- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, are there any plans for other movies or I guess it just depends on how this one does? They haven't told me, so I don't know. Okay. Yeah, Um, they had talked, eh, tiptoe talked about uh, doing the book, the camping thing. Mm -hmm. And but it has to be filmed in the summer. They have to find a camp. They got to get permission to film inside a camp someplace. And so it may not happen, but that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. it, It may happen, you know. In five years, I don't know. Right, right. Um, and then, uh, I've, you've already talked about the, the third book and, uh, so the continuation 
of Melody's story, and that will come out sometime in 2025, probably. Um, yes, because I have to turn it in. It's March, and I have to turn it in by September, I think, which is cutting it close. And then they have to chop it and fix it, and then they send it back for corrections, and then and then we do it, and we go through the fixing and the editing. It's kind of like what I did with my students. The, you know, you write the thing, I, I give you corrections, you do it again, you do it again. So yeah. it won't be soon, but it's coming. Yeah, there, yeah. There's, I mean, they, they have talked about the book too, but I don't know. Excellent, excellent. Um, so a lot of our listeners or educators, they're teachers either in the classroom or maybe they're principals or they, they might even be district leaders like administra- administrators, uh, assistant superintendents. Um, what is, if anything, would you want them to walk away with from our conversation talking about melody talking about you know um you know educating learners anything on top of mind well first of all i'd like to give a general word to all of them quit taking books out of libraries quit taking books away from teachers quit taking books out of classrooms let children read if uh if i as a parent don't want my child to read that book. That's my right. But you as an administrator do not have the right to tell my child what they cannot read. I live in Florida. In Florida, there are entire wings of buildings that are empty because all the books have been removed. Horrible, terrible books like Frog and Toad Are Friends because it talks about an interracial relationship between a frog and a toad. They, the, I, I, I have the list. There's like 400 books on here. Children's books, books that we read as kids, harmless books, books that somebody said, oh no, that approaches this particular subject. And it's not talking about anything bad. It's not talking, there's no sex, there's no violence, there's no killing. There's interaction of people getting along. And they've been... There's thousands of them that have been removed from the schools in Florida. And it's very, very sad and makes me very angry. Wow. Uh, Mrs. Draper bringing the fire about book banning. No, I really, <laughs> I really appreciate that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Quit um, banning books. My goodness. You want to ban something, ban math. That's hard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. After a quick break, the mystery question. The mystery question is... If you were a captain of a ship, what would you call it? <laughs> I would call it get me off of this thing. <laughs> no, um, I would call it uh, something having to do with. I'd, ha- I'd have to think about it. I'd have to do something to do with clean, something to do with water and something to do with movement. Hmm. Um, I. uh I went on one cruise and I didn't like it. Uh, I felt overwhelmed by the volume of water and by the, uh, the, the distance from land where I could actually touch ground. So it brought fear in me. And I don't often feel fear, but it made me feel fearful. Interesting. Uh, And so, and I know that there are a lot of things that young people face that is very fearful in their life. And they have lives that are very difficult from the lives that I grew up. I grew up with a mommy and a daddy and a brother and a sister and a cat and a dog. I had a perfect life. Mm. And, but there are kids that don't have that. And so I would like to do something that would touch and reach and help 
um, those kids that need love and support and connection and compassion. I don't know I if like, that answered the question or not, but it's that's okay. It, it's okay because it, it, we we can go however we want with this. And I don't know what I would call a a ship that I were a captain of, but it does. What you said it reminded me. My grandfather, um, his name is Julio, uh, was, uh, and he had a fishing boat and that he would, uh, and I would go deep sea fishing. I grew up in. Uh, the Los Angeles area. And we would go with my cousin uh, deep sea fishing. And um, I just remember the feeling of going out and like fishing and like him helping me with the, the, um, the, the bait and the, the, the hooks and everything like that. And we'd spend all day, like we'd get there like at five or six in the morning and then we'd go until two or three in the afternoon and we'd come back and we would drive from Long Beach is probably where we where we went out and then went back home. And I remember when I would get off the boat, I felt like I was still moving, you know, because of the, the your body and your, your senses are constantly moving on the boat. And mm-hmm. it that that feeling would last like for hours and hours. Um, and that's just a really um, nice memory that I have of. Now, do I f- go fishing anymore? No, <laughs> but I remember it. Yeah, and that's a good memory that you have. And that's the kind of thing that we have to do with children is give them connections and memories and things that they might not do. I will never go on another boat, not on purpose, you know, um, <laughs> Yeah, because it wasn't fun. I didn't enjoy it. It was terrifying to me. But you had to do it in order to learn that, nope, that's on my list of things I won't do. But the fact that it brings you fond memories of your grandfather makes it a very special memory. Mrs. Sharon Draper, thank you so much for being on the Think Inclusive podcast. It was a pleasure to speak with you. Well, it was certainly a delight. I I love talking to uh to young people, young readers, older people, and people who have children who might be readers and potential readers. And my final words are to just, you know, curl up with a favorite person and read together. That's it for this episode of Think Inclusive. We appreciate each and every one of you that hit play on this episode. If you want to say hi, I would love it. You can email me at tviegas at mcie.org. That's T-V-I-L-L-E-G-A-S at mcie.org. Or find us on the socials at think underscore inclusive. We're pretty much that everywhere. I'm personally really liking threads lately so check us out on there if you want thanks to brooks publishing for being a sponsor this season make sure to go to brookspublishing.com and check out their catalog no doubt you will find something very useful original music by miles kreditch additional music from melody that's m-e-l-o-d dot i-e if you're interested in checking them out thanks for your time and attention and remember inclusion always works I do a segment at the end of every interview called the mystery question. Um, and they're usually harmless questions. I read the question and then we both answer it. Now, again, I'm going to edit this out again. If it's something you don't want to answer, that's totally fine. Just let me know. And we will, you know, if you're up for, uh, if you're up for it, we can do it. There's never been a question asked that I could not think of an answer for. Okay, here we go. I challenge you. All right. All right. From MCIE.